Hello, my name is Ed Breitswert. I'm the Melanie E. S. Steele Professor of Medicine and Infectious Disease in the Comparative Medicine Institute at North Carolina State College of Veterinary Medicine. I am also an adjunct professor of medicine in the Division of Infectious Disease at Duke University Medical Center. In the context of disclosures, I, in conjunction with Dr. Sushama Santaki and North Carolina State University, hold a U.S. patent for the cultivation of microorganisms in an optimized insect biochemical composition growth media. I'm also the co-founder, a shareholder, and the chief scientific officer for Galaxy Diagnostics, a company that provides advanced diagnostic testing for the detection of Bartonella species infections. I do not intend to reference any off-label or non-FDA approved usage in this presentation. Our learning ob objectives for this particular module are to describe the vectors that are known to be competent for Bartonella species transmission, to describe the historical controversy and current understanding of tick transmission of Bartonella species, and finally, to describe transmission of Bartonella species by other modes other than vectors. So just as a really quick introduction to this module, the Bartonellas are alpha proteobacteria with a very prolonged dividing time of 22 to 24 hours, similar to Mycobacterium tuberculosis, which is the primary factor that has caused microbiologists to have difficulty in isolating these organisms from patients. And Bartonella infects numerous cells in the body, erythrocytes, endothelial cells, microglial cells, macrophages, and CD34 progenitor cells in the bone marrow, all of which have varying consequences in the context of symptomatology in our patients. And I think it's important to point out that this is fairly unique for a vector transmitted organism, whereas most other tick transmitted organisms, if we use Babesia, for example, it infects erythrocytes. If we use Anaplasma phagocytophilum, neutrophils, or Lichia chaffeeensis monocytes. So the fact that Bartonella can invade um, and persist in so many cells is a really, really important factor in our understanding ultimately of the pathogenesis associated with this genus. So our focus here is on vector transmission and the primary infection strategy of Bartonella is essentially twofold. One, we believe that through tick bites and sand flag bites, the organism is injected under the skin and is ultimately picked up by dendritic cells likely and carried either by the lymphatic system or into the circulation um, to the endothelium. So what we can see here is a alternative means of transmission where if this is a flea or a louse, then once this flea takes a blood meal from an infected cat, and then it will, as we'll see, multiply the Bartonella within its intestinal tract, deposit the Bartonella onto the skin, which ultim ultimately with fleas causes a lot of scratching. That scratching inoculates the organism into the subcutaneous tissues, which again are picked up by cells and carried to the systemic circulation where the first cell to be infected is the endothelial cell. This is, is actually done by a very unique process called invasome-mediated invasion. Um, and then once these bacteria have proliferated in the endothelial cells up to a number of generally eight to 12, they'll be released into systemic circulation. They'll enter the erythrocyte and um, they will then be carried throughout the body, particularly to microcirculatory sites, which obviously exist throughout our body. So again, we will cover pathogenesis in a subsequent module. So that our focus here is to 
stay with our vectors and how the Bartonella is getting transmitted from animals to humans. The Bartonella species that we know are vector transmitted are Bartonella bacilliformis, Quintana hensilae, um, Gramii, and Bovis. And you'll see that sand flies, the human body louse, and increasingly some concern over the common head louse, cat scratch disease um, we had covered earlier, and the cat flea transmits Bartonella hensilae, um, Tenocephales nobilis for rodent transmission of Bartonella gramii in the laboratory, and biting flies transmitting Bartonella bovis amongst cattle. So I happen to live on a farm, and about 80% of the cattle on my farm have Bartonella bovis in their blood. So I want to focus primarily on Bartonella hensilae and its transmission because this is the most common Bartonella that infects cats, dogs, and humans in North America and likely throughout much of the world. It causes a significant illness in some people, cats, dogs, and horses, and as we'll see in subsequent modules, those illnesses and the pathology that is caused by Bartonella hensilae can be identical across species, essentially the same pathology in people, in dogs and horses, or in people, cats and dogs. And the common cat flea is a vector, uh, or the vector based on laboratory studies using flea transmission. Cats and other mammals are reservoir hosts and this will be important again when we get to a subsequent slide in regard to the other mammals. And intraerythrocytic stage results in passage of viable bacteria in the flea frass. So this is a laboratory picture of fleas being grown um, for various purposes. These little white things are flea eggs. Um, this is kind of the blood in feces of the, the fleas. And this again is an electron micrograph generated by Dorsey Cordic when we were first starting to look at cats carrying Bartonella and inducing cat scratch disease in humans. And this is a single erythrocyte with two Bartonellas as we discussed in the previous slides. So one of the important things about Bartonella hensilae and fleas is the fact that the flea will start passing viable Bartonella hensilae in the feces within 24 hours of becoming infected. So once that flea takes a blood meal, it's, and that's the earliest time point anybody's looked, but by 24 hours, you can culture Bartonella hensilae out of that flea frass. It's passed for the 12 day lifespan of a flea in the laboratory, whereas fleas in nature and in your carpet would generally live for three to four weeks. And we presume that it's continually passaged in fleas in nature as well as in the laboratory. We know that Bartonella hensilae is viable in flea feces for at least nine days based on, again, laboratory studies. And more recently in our laboratory, we have grown Bartonella hensilae on plates, allowed it to dry out completely, and then reconstituted it in liquid media. And it survives without any nutritional support for at least two weeks. We're extending these studies at this point in time to actually see how long it's viable in the environment, which again is new information and somewhat disconcerting information in the context of this organism's potential viability. So I wanted to highlight one study from a good friend and infectious disease veterinarian, Dr. Michael Lappin at Colorado State University. And Michael published this in Veterinary Dermatology back in 2009. And he looked at cats and fleas in uh, Alabama, Florida, and Colorado. And 
the fleas actually were only from cats in Alabama that were at a shelter. And you can see that a lot of the fleas contained Bartonella henselae and Rickettsia felis, actually all groups that they studied, these were pooled, pooled flea groups. And what you can also see is that if you look at cats that are coming into rescue centers in Alabama and Florida, essentially 60% of them were bacteremic by PCR testing alone. When Mike looked at the skin or nail clippings from the claw bids or the gingiva, um, skin was another good site to obtain, and these were animals that were being um, spayed, so during the spay they would obtain a small piece of skin. And, and so the, the emphasis here is they found predominantly Bartonella henselae and Bartonella clerigiae, along with Rickettsia felis, which are all known to be transmitted by cat fleas. Rickettsia felis causes an acute febrile illness in humans, has been reported throughout much of the world at this point in time. The illness is much less severe and the organism much less pathogenic than um, what we see with other uh, Rickettsia species like Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever or Rickettsia canori in the Mediterranean basin. So, Going back to cat scratch disease, this is the prototypical lesion that we see in cat scratch disease with a inoculation papule on the finger of this veterinarian and lymphadenopathy. So the classical triad of cat scratch disease associated with fleas and bacteremic cats. In the context of laboratory studies, we know that the common cat flea can transmit Bartonella henselae, Bartonella clerigiae, and Bartonella cholerae from a bacteremic cat to a specific pathogen-free cat. We also know from work done at CDC that Bartonella bovis was amplified and sequenced from the blood of cats, mostly in the Midwestern portion of the United States um, in studies that CDC was doing back in the 1990s. And then we and others have amplified Bartonella quintana from either cats or cat fleas. In the laboratory, we know that Bartonella henselae, Bartonella clerigiae, and Bartonella cholerae can be transmitted by the common cat flea from bacteremic cats to naive specific pathogen free cats. We also know that CDC isolated Bartonella bovis from the blood of cats, predominantly in the Midwestern United States. And our laboratory has isolated Bartonella quintana from feral cats. And the French have amplified and sequenced Bartonella quintana from cat fleas. So it is possible that all of these organisms could be transmitted from a infected cat to a human via a scratch or via a bite or due to bites from fleas, which is suspected but not well documented. The importance of the pet flea cycle is the fact that <clears throat> the same flea that infests cats also infests raccoons coyotes, foxes, throughout our suburban areas in the United States, wherever all these animals and wildlife commingle. Now, coming back to Bartonella henselae fleas and involvement of disease in both dogs and humans, this is a publication from Dr. Michael Rossi and our research group in which a dog with granulomatous paniculitis, this is a eight-year-old Labrador retriever who lived with an elderly gentleman that was 78 years old who had neurologic disease. And the 
two obviously resided in the same household. Histologically, the dog had nodular paniculitis. And Michael contacted us because the onset of dermatological lesions was simultaneous in both the dog and the owner. As you'll see, we were able to PCR Bartonella hensilae directly from the skin lesion of the dog. And we now, from several publications in the veterinary literature, know that Bartonella hensilae can be a cause of nodular paniculitis in dogs and has been reported in association with paniculitis in humans. And from the gentleman, we were able to get blood for serology and culture, and he was blood culture positive um, for Bartonella hensilae. The isolates we got from the dog and the human were identical by DNA sequencing. And from the dog's biopsy, we were able, using immunohistochemistry, you can see the red dots here, identify the Bartonella organisms within the dermis. Now, importantly, which again we'll discuss when we get to diagnostics, is both dogs and humans are frequently seronegative to Bartonella hensilae if we're dealing with a chronic long-standing infection. And the reasons for this is not yet clear, but we believe that with long-standing infections, dogs and humans develop a degree of energy. So we're gonna transition now from fleas as a obviously important and primary vector to ticks. And the evidence for tick transmission in the context of indirect or circumstantial evidence is very substantial, but is still hotly debated. And that debate um, goes back to this publication in Emerging Infectious Diseases in 2010. One of my PhD students had previously written a review on all the vectors that we knew about Bartonella transmission and Professor Didier Riol in Marseille contacted us to combine our efforts to do a review that focused on the potential of tick-borne transmission of Bartonelloses um, in animals and humans in Europe and the United States. Um, in the same issue, uh, Sam Telford, who is a veterinary parasitologist and a good friend, and Gary Wormser, a physician, um, infectious disease physician, essentially wrote the cons to whether ticks were actually transmitting or not. So this um, was just part of the controversy that was developing. So Sarah's manuscript was published in Veterinary Animology in 2008. And I usually like to joke and say that one day I walked into the lab and asked her if she would be willing to review all the world literature on the transmission of Bartonella. And she jumped up and down and said, yes, I'd love to do so. Um, that's not exactly the true story, but with some badgering, uh, she did review and it's a very, thorough and complete review as to what we knew in 2008. So what was the circumstantial evidence? Well, in regard to case-based evidence, we saw dogs that had ticks that we documented Bartonella infection, and that was true in humans as well. And the epidemiological data, which was at the time stronger in dogs than in humans, um, is if a dog had antibodies to Anaplasma phagus autophilum at the University of California at Davis Veterinary College, it statistically had antibodies to a Bartonella species. And we were seeing the same thing with antibodies to Bartonella and Babesia or Bartonella and Ehrlichia, suggesting that if not the same vector, at least there was some common exposures occurring where dogs were becoming infected with these organisms in areas where they were becoming infected with known tick transmitted organisms such as Anaplasma, Ehrlichia, or Babesia. So in the, at this point, we had 
talked about Relman using PCR from uh, human tissues, but now investigators were extracting DNA from ticks and targeting Bartonella genes and amplifying Bartonella DNA there. So in 2008, um, some veterinarians at Alfort in Paris um, trying to understand whether, and they've done a tremendous amount of wonderful work trying to understand whether Oxodes rhesus could transmit Bartonella species. Um, their study really suggested that transmission of Bartonella hensilae in, in a model system uh, did occur, but it wasn't in a tick attachment to a animal system, so it was a maybe. And then in 2011, that same group um, working with Michael Levin at the CDC in Atlanta actually did a study using ticks, Oxodes rhesus, essentially our counterpart to Oxodes specificus and Oxodes scapularis, and a rodent Bartonella species to document transmission in the laboratory. So at least at this point, we knew that laboratory transmission of a rodent Bartonella species by an Oxodes species was possible. But I think where we are in regard to North America and tick transmission of Bartonella, particularly Bartonella hensilae, is we're, we're still at maybe. And there are hopefully some studies ongoing now that are going to either say maybe yes or maybe no or definitively no. So just a little more information about Bartonella hensilae and ticks based on PCR studies. And this study by Dietrich in Volkart Kemp's group in Frankfurt, essentially the Frankfurt group PCR for Borrelia burgdorferi and Bartonella hensilae, they didn't find much Borrelia burgdorferi, but they found an awful lot of Bartonella hensilae in ticks. And what they also found is these ticks were from Germany, France, and Portugal. And the further south they went, the higher prevalence um, they could find of Bartonella hensilae in ticks. So they actually sent the extracted DNA from Germany to our lab, blinded, and we PCR'd using a different gene target. Volcard's group used the 16S ribosomal RNA gene, and we used the 16S 23S intergenic spacer region, again, just a different target in a different laboratory in a different continent and our results matched up about 98% of the time. They had a couple positives that we did not, and we had a couple positives that they did not, which is expected when you're dealing with DNA extractions and PCR. And then the next study that we'll cover is this one by um, Morel Vesey's laboratory, which is um, coming up in, in the next two slides. So this again is from, um, Rieger in Dr. Kemp's lab, and in 2016, they did a manuscript entitled A One Health Approach to Bartonellosis is Needed, and part of that, they brought back this issue of what's going on with Bartonella species in ticks and potential tick transmission. And again, if we go down here to the Dietrich study, you'll see that from Germany, France, and Portugal. Overall, there was about um, 13 or 14% positivity. In Russia, uh, essentially 40 some percent. This very early study from Schulz in the Netherlands um, got an extremely high percentage of Bartonella hensilae. Again, back then we weren't sequencing every amplicon to prove the specificity of what we were finding, but I think it's fair to say that if we combine all these studies from North America here, a very early study again in New Jersey that was not confirmed by DNA sequencing, but other studies from California that were confirmed from uh, Bruno Schimmel's lab, is overall the median, uh, the mean was about 15% of the ticks tested in multiple countries on multiple continents. Um, contain a Bartonella species and most often Bartonella hensilae.
So this is from, again, the Vesey lab. And what was very interesting to me when they published this in 2016 using next-gen sequencing to determine the phylogenetic diversity of what was in ticks is that Bartonella henselae again appears through next-gen sequencing rather than targeted sequencing, which was used by Kempf and others in those studies that I showed you on the previous slide. And what you can also see is the amount of Bartonella henselae in the ticks almost equated to all the Borrelias, Borrelia burgdorferi sensulato, essentially sensu stricto, azolfii, garinii, all of these Borrelias here added up were about the same. And that's what Kempf and our group found when he looked at ticks that were collected in Germany, France, and Portugal, again, um, with the higher prevalence, the further south you went towards the Mediterranean basin. So the other um, table in this particular study that was fascinating to me, and I'll just call your attention to Bartonella henselae. So they looked at forested areas and they looked at hedge areas, essentially parks with um, the plants and hedges planted in and around your typical uh, park in Europe. And if you look at the forested areas, essentially they went from a zero prevalence as a low up to a 36% prevalence of Bartonella henselae DNA in the ticks with obviously variation amongst the group. But they essentially found the, the same trend over here where some of the ticks in the hedges were zero versus 32%. So we still don't understand this, whether there could be, as we see with Rickettsia rickettsii, transovarial transmission of these organisms, or is it that the ticks in certain areas are more likely to feed on feral cats that are bacteremic, and that's the reason we're finding such a high prevalence um, in both larval I'm sorry, nymphal and adult ticks, which are in amongst these various studies. So still a lot of questions in regard to ticks, but we were contacted by a physician, um, a human anesthesiologist in Netherlands, and she indicated that um, she and her son had developed some neurological problems and that her son had developed these unusual kind of stretch marks or striated lesions. And these were on his back, on his abdomen, and on his limbs. And she had read some of our publications relative to Bartonella and asked if we would be willing to enter her entire family, which was mother, son, daughter, and father, into our IRB study. Um, the good news is both based on serology and BAPGM enrichment blood culture, the father and daughter were totally negative by our testing, and that was not the case for the mother and the son. The mother wanted us to have optimal samples to work with, so she actually flew the entire family to Raleigh, North Carolina. She also arranged for a surgical biopsy to be done at a local hospital for her son. And you can see that they biopsy adjacent to these lesions and there is a lymphocytic plasmacytic perivasculitis in the subcutaneous tissues. And working with Dr. Marna Erickson at um, the University of Minnesota Department of Dermatology, Marna had developed confocal immunohistochemistry, again, the ability to not just have one plane but to sequentially cut through these tissues with a confocal microscope after staining them with a antibody specific to Bartonella henselae. So the mother, we obtained a isolate from the blood culture. The son was blood culture negative. 
um, but PCR positive from his skin lesion. The important reason that this is included in this particular lecture is this family never had cats, never had dogs, never had a flea infestation, but they owned a summer home on the coast of uh, the Netherlands and would visit there with deer going through the backyards as we see in the Northeastern United States and the son and the mother had experienced tick infestations. So to finish up on tick transmission of Bartonella hensile, the jury is still out. There's ex vivo evidence that Oxodes recensus can transmit B. hensile in a laboratory setting. There's in vivo transmission in a rodent model using again Oxodes recensus and a rodent Bartonella species. There's clearly been detection of Bartonella hensile in patients bitten by ticks in the United States, and that would apply to dogs as well. And there are clearly individuals that are being diagnosed di by various diagnostic laboratories in North America with both Bartonella hensile and Borrelia burgdorferi. So we've now covered fleas, and we've covered ticks, and we're going to spend just a little bit of time on transmission by other vectors that are potentially transmitting Bartonella in nature. So this story evolved when the mother contacted me by email. And one of the things I've learned about mothers who have sick children is that they're on the internet generally between midnight and two o'clock in the morning. And because I can tell when the email was posted, not when I happened to read it the next morning. And so the, the story here is this young man had developed guillain barre syndrome, which was refractory to IBIG treatment, and ultimately was diagnosed with the demyelinating form of polyneuropathy. The, this young man was having trouble in school, not concentrating, having a bit of an attitude problem, and the mother was having headaches and felt that she was having problems with her short-term memory loss. Fortunately, the father was healthy and um, hadn't experienced any bites from these spiders, which are called woodlouse hunter spiders. And how the spiders became part of this story is the family lived in this apartment um, at the time of a woodlouse hunter spider infestation, the apartment was adjacent to a creek. They had severe flooding. When that flooding occurred, they had um, water in there. Anytime there's water and wood, there's wood lice that come in to try to work things over a bit. And these spiders, as I understand from the literature, preferentially like to eat these little guys. So at the time the family contacted us, they had actually moved from this house, were living at, moved from this apartment, were living in a house they had purchased. And the mother and the two sons were infected with Bartonella hensile. The father went back to the area and turned over wood and other things until he could find a couple spiders and some wood lice. And Patricia Mascarelli, a postdoc in our laboratory, amplified and sequenced Bartonella hensile and Bartonella hensile from the wood lice. So the mother had pictures of bites on the two sons. They had captured the wood lice within their apartment. Um, and we ultimately had obtained the same sequences out of everybody over a span of about a year and a half. So spider transmission of an infectious agent um, is not thought to occur. But in the context of what happened in that family, we believe that transmission may have been via the woodlouse hunter spider. This is another interesting story from upstate New York in which the owner actually, actually contacted us um, after she experienced a rat mite infestation in her house. And your question, uh, because it was certainly my question, is how do you get a rat mite infestation into a house? And the way you do that is you call an exterminator to crawl up under your house because you've been hearing funny noises at night. 
um, like animals running around and rustling through the leaves. And the exterminator says, well, you've got raccoons under your house and I can trap them and get rid of them, which they did very efficiently. And rat mites only have blood as a nutritional source. So they were pretty happy under the house as long as there was raccoon blood. But once the raccoon blood was gone, they went into the house and infested and bit the owner as well as her two dogs. Um, the owner had an acute onset of lethargy and fatigue um, that developed about 31 days after the rat mite infestation in the house. Interestingly, which is an extension of where our research has taken us in recent years, she was hospitalized due to panic attacks, depression, headaches, and chills in September the 11th. She had developed vesicular lesion at the mite bite sites, and so had both her dogs. Um, and the dogs were very paritic, and according to the owner, were behaving very abnormally, which could have been due to the irritation from the bites and the scratching. But to make a long story short, both dogs, the owner and the mites, which fortunately were maintained in alcohol and identified at Cornell's um, veterinary diagnostic lab as um, rat mites, uh, were tested by uh, us and all contained Bartonella henselae. So, Pigeon mite transmission of Bartonella quintana has been reported by DDA Riol's lab in, in France, and we've reported rat mite transmission of Bartonella henselae uh, in seemingly infected both humans and uh, the owners. So in regard to vectors, I just want to use endocarditis again as our baseline, and the fact that we've got numerous Bartonella species over literally a decade that have been identified as a cause. We've got numerous reservoirs, which we'll consider reservoirs on a subsequent module. But importantly, we've got known vectors and suspected vectors. And Bartonella alceticus in rabbits and the people that have been infected with either endocarditis or granulombus lymphadenitis have either butchered rabbits or hunted rabbits. So we suspect that a bite, scratch, or um, potentially a cut could have been the source of their infection. And in this instance, Bartonella mayotinensis was identified after DNA sequencing of this organism from a heart valve removed at the Mayo Clinic. At the time, we did not know that the bat was a reservoir. We still do not know how that individual became infected, but we do know that bat flies are the vector now for bats and that Bartonella mayotinensis has been found both in bats in the United States and throughout much of Northern Europe. So again, our emphasis in this particular module is on the known vectors, which are clearly lice and fleas and sand flies. Um, we've discussed the importance of ticks, and there's a lot more work that needs to be done there to firm up that story. And we've talked about some other vectors. Before we finish, I want to give you two other ways that we believe Bartonella is infected. And in this instance, a veterinarian in our hospital um, was examining a dog that had developed cutaneous tumors rapidly over its entire dorsal surface of its body. Um, she did an aspirate of the tumors, which our cytopathologist said, I can't tell you exactly what type of histiocytic neoplasia this is, but it is a histiocytic cancer. The dog was very fractious. It was a great big newfie, and it um, resulted in a needle stick where the veterinarian aspirated the tumor and then stuck the needle in her hand. The hospital administrator um, in charge of our hospital contacted me because our lab's done a lot of work on Ehrlichia transmission and Ehrlichia infections in animals and humans over the years. 
And the question was, Ed, this dog was diagnosed with Ehrlichia about six months ago. It was treated with doxycycline. Um, one of our veterinarians just had an accidental needle sick. Could Ehrlichia have been transmitted? And we, I suggested that I didn't know the answer to that question, and I thought it perhaps unlikely with the circumstances, but if we entered this individual in our IRB Bartonella study, we could concurrently test for Ehrlichia. The other thing that was going through my mind based on the second PhD student that worked on Bartonella in our lab is that 33% of Ehrlichia canis reactors dogs in the southeastern United States are concurrently seroreactive to Bartonella vinsonii burkhoffii. So we, the veterinarian agreed to enter the IRB study. Um, within five days of the needle stick, we got the first blood sample in the lab and everything was negative for Ehrlichia and everything that we did was negative for Bartonella. No antibodies to any of the six Bartonellas we were testing against. Um, no direct DNA of Bartonella uh, extracted from the blood and the enrichment cultures, which we tested seven, 14 and 21 days were negative. The next sample we got was at day 33 when this veterinarian was starting to get some headaches and we were fortunate, we as in Dr. Ricardo Maggi, the research scientist in the lab, to be able to amplify and sequence Bartonella vinsonii burkhoffi genotype one. This is the original type strain of Bartonella that we isolated from a dog at NC State in 1993. On day 81, we got the next blood sample because the neurological signs were progressing in this person with sensory neuropathy, tingling, um, and more severe headaches and migraines. And in this instance, extraction from the blood was negative, but we got by DNA sequencing the same Bartonella subspecies and the exact same genotype. There are four BVB genotypes. What I also want to emphasize, since we have sequential data, and I'm only showing you part of the data that is in this manuscript, we didn't bleed this veterinarian to death, but we had a bunch of data points as both she was interested in knowing what was going on and so were we. And what you can see here is that it was somewhere between day 81 and 110 that she finally seroconverted with an antibody titer to Vinsonii burkhoffi at 1 to 128. At this point, <clears throat> because she was culture positive, because she was seroreactive, and because she was really having more severe um, headaches, she was treated by Dr. Chris Woods, an infectious disease physician and collaborator at Duke University Medical Center. Um, following her treatment, we tested her multiple times and she went negative from blood PCR, negative from enrichment culture PCR, and had um, zero reversion, which is what we see in dogs and humans, when we actually clear this infection. So the last case that we'll talk about is again, a late night email from a mother whose family has been sick for literally a decade. And the other part of this history that's pertinent is the mother had problems getting pregnant over several years, had had a couple miscarriages, and finally, through in vitro fertilization, had become pregnant. Ten years later, she contacted me <clears throat> to ask whether Bartonella might be involved in the illness that her ex family was experiencing. What made this situation unique is the fact that she had twins. <clears throat> excuse me, and one twin died at eight days of age. Working with the pathologist who did the autopsy on this child, we were able to retrieve the paraffin blocks and amplify and sequence Bartonella vinsonii subspecies Burkhoffi and Bartonella henselae from the tissues of the twins. We were also able to document the same genotype of Vinsonii burkhoffi in the father, 
the mother and the son, and the mother and the son had the same PCR DNA sequence strain confirmed in the context of Bartonella hensile. Finally, we were able, or the mother was able, to get placental tissues that were in a paraffin block from 1998, um, essentially when the children were born, and cervical biopsy um, from 1991. We were able to amplify Bartonella hensile from the cervical biopsy, but we were not able to amplify any Bartonella DNA from the placental tissues. One of the important take home messages in regard to this data right here is if you want to test tissue, do not put it in formally. Obtain a biopsy for your pathologist for H&E that can be put into a paraffin block, but formalin denatures DNA, it crosslinks DNA, and if you've got a very small amount of bacterial DNA, regardless of the target that you're looking for in that formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissue, it'll be negative. So a negative result here to me is meaningless. A positive result confirmed by sequencing is meaningful, meaning that organism was definitely there but both of these were from stored formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissue blocks. So in this instance, one, we could say that we believe these individuals were infected with the same Bartonella for at least a decade, and also that this child had the same Bartonellas in the tissues um, after dying of a heart defect shortly after birth. So to conclude, um, the genus Bartonella are very unique in the context of one health importance to veterinary medicine and human medicine. There are numerous vector competent arthropods. Non-vectorial transmission by needle stick to veterinarians have been reported by us and by other investigators now. Bartonella hensile is viable in the environment in flea feces um, for at least nine days and likely in the environment much longer than that. Possible transmission by ants, which I didn't cover from the United States and Australia, spiders and mites have been reported in case reports and tick transmission seems likely but remains controversial and unconfirmed for Bartonella hensile in North America. With that, Again, I'd like to thank everyone in my laboratory for all the hard work and generating the samples and the results, and particularly the PhD students have worked on optimizing our testing for Bartonella over the years and has done a lot of the testing on the various vectors. And finally, the references that were cited in this module um, on this slide and the subsequent slides. With that, I again want to thank you very much for your attention and I hope that this information is valuable to you um, the next time you're examining one of your patients. Thank you very much.